Hello and welcome back. I am here with MasterCard Player of the Week, Danny, who's been putting up these insane numbers that you see right here. So first of all, congratulations. Um, when I first talked to you at the very beginning, before you played a single game in LCS, you told me, I asked you like what your goals were for the split. And you said this, I want to not be the one person on my team that could be the reason why we're not doing well. You have obviously vastly surpassed those expectations. So I wanted to ask you, what are your goals as a player now? Well, when I said that, it was when I was first coming in. And now looking back at it, I think that's a really bad goal because <laughs> being the person who doesn't lose you games is like nice, sure. But being not like not being the person who wins you the game can be really sad too. So that's like my new goal. I want to be the the reason why we win games. And I think uh, we are, I'm like a win con for our team, but I think all of our teammates are like so good that we all can like do different things and be uh, like try different styles with every person and each one can carry, like Impact can carry, Jojo can carry, Inspired definitely can carry. <laughs> like all of us have a time to shine. So I just want to be like one of the reasons why we win. Nice. I think you've already exceeded that expectation, but continuing it is also a very good goal. Um, tomorrow, going up against 100 Thieves, obviously, they're also a top team. Um, we're especially looking at like the two top laners going up. How are you guys preparing for that match specifically? First 100 Thieves, I mean, I've, I think we figured them out like really easily. Um, we know how they like to play and how aggressive they can be, especially their bot lane. So we just got to take it slow. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to join me and back to the State Farm Analyst Desk. Hello and welcome back to the State Farm <laughs> Analyst oh, Desk. No. Mark the Gremlin. Uh, yep. <laughs> is taking this. Yeah, you were in that shot, Mark. Mark the Gremlin is taking this uh, segment off. Uh, and again, we're lucky to have Whippo here. He's going to help us preview the matchup all before you go and cast it, my friend. You're pulling triple duty here on the LCS with the interviews yeah. as well. Yeah. It was great to hear from Danny in the mm -hmm. Player of the Week interview and uh, the update to his goals. Um, but as well, his quick thoughts on how uh, he believes they've already figured out. 100 Thieves as an opponent, and quite obviously EG is the team to beat right now, but there's a fair level of confidence for him coming in against one of his stiffest competition, I would argue. I agree. I mean, it's how it should be, right? If you're the first in the in the regular season, it would be kind of disappointing to hear that he feels like he's going to lose. <laughs> so uh, I'm happy to hear that there's confidence. Uh, I think confidence is where all good things start. Yeah, yeah. I would have enjoyed watching Emily navigate an interview, though, where he says, I actually just think we're going to lose. <laughs> it would have been fun to watch I that like, struggle. like, well, okay, why do you think that? <laughs> um, Emily, you did uh, tip your cap, though, in, in that question to the fact that we as a desk are very much looking at the top lane uh, mm -hmm. matchup uh, within this one. Obviously, someday impact um, within this year alone, top performers, but throughout their entire careers now, when we think about how they've played in the LCS, uh, these are two of the best, two of the greatest. Yeah, so uh, spoilers, we're going to be having some top lists come out to celebrate that we are in the 10th year of the LCS. And one of those was kind of uh, top five players in every position. So I actually voted these two uh, at the top of, one, two? of my top five. Yeah, one, nice. two, uh, impact one and someday two. So um, I think these are two players who have become staples of the LCS and I just wanted to ask Whippo what it's like uh, going up against them. Uh, I think they're really strong players individually and they're quite similar actually. I think they play a very similar style where uh, they make sure they're solid in the game and then they really look to have impact and make differences uh, in the mid to late game stages with teleport usage mainly. I think they mm -hmm. play side lane really well, they have really great understanding of the game and it's hard to really trump them in the basics. You know, you can't really smash them in lane early game or uh, try to out-rotate them in the mid game. They're very smart players, they know what they're doing and I think that um, they, they're, they have the fewest weaknesses out of the top laners in the LCS right now. Yeah, and I, I think, especially since these players, both of them, are very selfless, a lot of the times they're the players that are playing weak side or uh, will be committing resources like to the rest of the team. Um, how important do you feel like it is to be uh, that type of player? Or even just the idea of, like, people will always challenge impact historically of being, like, more versatile, playing more carries, and he does that, right? In fact, on Sunday's birthday, he played the Akali. But then, of course, like, the team needs him to, like, play more firmly like tops, like centric, or at least like resourceless champions. So how do you feel about them? Do they, do you want them to continue to play that style? 
Um, I think the like having a carry up like a carry angle as a top laner is something that's like granted to you by the team, or it's like it's not something that like you can create yourself. Like I think uh, picking a carry top laner uh, requires your team to fill in those gaps, right? Like you probably have a lack of engage if you pick a champion mm -hmm. like Akali. Like mm -hmm. Akali can't go in one v five and kill everyone, right? She needs space in the team fight. She needs to be able to get her spells off, and no matter what, you, you need card control and some kind of front line in order to create you that space to even look for a flank in the first place. So carry top laners in the traditional sense of like the Kale, the Akali, like very squishy high damage burst or DPS champions, they're hard to find because everyone else in the draft has to give you that angle, that they have to give up their picks and, and pick something that's more suited towards you. Uh, zooming out just a little bit, um, I kind of want to reference something you said earlier in the broadcast uh, following uh, game one, where you mentioned mm -hmm. that you feel the best way to play the game is through mid and then to a side lane, and probably more often than not the bot side as opposed to the top side. When you think of these two teams, obviously both, have tremendous rosters of players, you know, in all roles, mm -hmm. but also two of the best bot lanes that we have. And we know that 100 Thieves from their winning ways, uh, when they were uh, LCS champions, a lot of it came from the strength of, of that bot lane. Same thing, we've got, uh, you know, Danny popping off as well. Do you feel like one team uh, currently plays better around uh, the bot lane than the other? Um, it's actually kind of hard to say. I think 100 Thieves does play better around bot lane. I actually don't think EG plays around their bot lane that much. I think oh, that's actually unique about them, where uh, Evil Geniuses is really good at just playing the map, and they do what's natural for them. They do what's natural for Inspired, more, more, most of anything. Okay. That's like the number one thing they focus on, is they make sure Inspired's in a great position to play his game, and uh, everyone follows suit incredibly well on that. That's awesome. That's very, very cool. See, this is why we bring you on, Bopo. Well, that's what I think. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I that's love them, look, man. When that's... I watch them play, like I, I jungled for a split, and yeah. I can tell very well they're very good around playing Inspired. Like when Inspired is not around, they make sure they back off. When Inspired is there, they go very aggressive very quickly, and I think that that's a great skill set for anything right. to have. Well, then I mean, we will keep a, uh, a watchful eye on the jungle. I'm being told that it's time for us to say goodbye to you and send you on over to the caster desk. Uh, right. We'll talk a little bit more while he gets all set up over there. Uh, with Kobe and Captain Flowers for the cast. Enjoy it, my friend. While he makes his way, uh, we're going to get a word from JoJo on what it's like to lane against Abadaga. I mean, I feel like people talk about Abadaga's laning being bad or something, but I feel like his laning is better than most of the mids in the league. He actually tries to do something, you know, instead of, like, other mid laners just not doing anything, taking zero risks, and just giving prior. Um, I feel like he actually tries to do something, which I think is, you know, better than most mids in LCS, so... <laughs> You gotta look out for the guests, right? You gotta be a good host. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey man, I pride myself on having one of those. Wait, are we? I don't know if they can hear us. Oh, hey, is that us? Are we live? Are we back? I hope so. Um, mid lane. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk Boom. about it. Uh, Captain Flowers is clearly hyped for the cast, and we'll get you out there as quickly as possible. Uh, Jojo Abadaga, though. Uh, obviously, the first time around in this matchup was pretty funny, right? That's a pe people remember there was the LeBlanc Ari matchup, which kind of went a little uh, askew, uh, yeah. for lack of a better word, early for JoJo. Uh, but this is a guy who we know brings the heat in the lane, and for that to be kind of the critical point uh, for Abadaga, I wonder if. Uh, anything will be decided in that early mid lane phase at all. I mean, I think it will be really interesting. I also really like how JoJo phrased that. And I feel like, again, talking to him in an interview last week, coming off of MSI, he's really trying to evaluate mids more holistically. And you heard him actually praising, like, he's like, I actually think Ava does a lot in lane and he does a ton for his team. So he, like, obviously thinks of him really, really highly. And I, I think it's just worth noting that uh, he is a player in JoJo who will take the skillier, more difficult matchups. Just yesterday in the game, he was like, oh, this is a really good Swain angle. And he's like, pick me the Akali. And he was like <laughs> 50 CS up. And so if he's praising Abadaga's landing, then it's, it speaks that it's better than maybe it's shown on stage as well. It could be a lot of times informed by what's going on in scrims. And maybe JoJo feels like, hey, this is a guy who actually can test me when I go for this aggressive stuff. Yeah, in the past couple of weeks, I feel like the first two to three weeks, a little bit, was mostly when the criticisms came in with Abadaga. Uh, but like, it's definitely been here him either going even or putting a clinic. So I, yeah. I've been really enjoying Abadaga's landing. And I feel like as a whole, uh, the team is on point. Yeah. Actually, this may be dangerous, Dash. Uh, what might be dangerous? I have faith in 100 Thieves. You're oh, predicting you it to win? You're already going there. I am going straight So hold up, the, Brad, yes. because I have a lot riding on this match. Okay. There's, yeah, this, this is, there's a lot riding that. on this match between me and, <laughs> between me and Jack, okay? Yes. 
Get me out of that single. <laughs> if EG wins, they save me from hypothermia. But okay, your Joe. prediction With is that here. Is that 100 is going to take? If 100 no, Thieves wins, I got to do an ice I'd bath. put you in danger. I'd put you yeah, in danger. Yeah, that's what you're doing. Okay, I so. think 100 Thieves, especially after the last game they had in which FBI and Huhi were dominating lane, it felt like Abadaga was on point. The team as a whole, I felt like they were in playoff mode. So the faith is there. I give wow. it to 100 Thieves. Wow. All right. So the 100 Thieves prediction there. I mean, I take it, Mark, by you scooting over that you're not for that. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I didn't know. And that's what I was about to say. I was like, but you don't we know what you just joined forces with. Prediction. We did not right. know, but I assumed if it was if she said 100 Thieves, I'd have to like go back up there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I guess, Emily, what's the call? Since we know where he's going, we know he's not with 100 Thieves. Oh, yeah. I, I said EG just okay. because I think um, regardless of what 100 Thieves want to do, I do think that EG have just overall been playing the map better. So even if, you know, something happens in the individual laning, I have more faith in their mid game. Yeah, I believe in 100 Thieves a lot, but I just believe in EG a lot more. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Mark and Emily want to see me freeze. Or no, don't want to see me freeze. They I want believe to see in me. Yeah. Raz wants to see me freeze. That tracks with everything the fans I know about also him. Should want to see you freeze. Yeah. All right, that's enough out of us. Flowers, Zayo, Bupo, take it away. Welcome back, everybody. We have installed a wide-angle lens here on the LCS cameras to welcome our latest casting talent, Mr. Bwipo himself, here on the desk today with myself and Isaac Bwipo. Thank you so much for joining us, buddy. Thank you as well. It's an honor, really. I've uh, I've grown up on watching uh, LCS cast and whatnot, and it's, uh, it's a real honor. I mean, you're making the full tour. You did the analyst desk, yeah. you did the interview, now you're going to cast. You already played today. I feel like this is this is probably unparalleled. I don't know if anyone has ever done all those yeah, he's things He's on the before. tour to desk. Yeah. He's making it happen, baby. And we got a great game to have him on, to have him as the guest cast here 100 thieves and evil geniuses two of the teams at the top of the table uh what about what are you ex what are you expecting for this one what are your thoughts just coming into this so the first thing i look at is the gangplank priority difference so 100 thieves hasn't played a single game of gangplank and you know community loves harping on how broken he is mm -hmm. uh and with that in mind it's going to be very interesting to see where the priority is going to be at he's not going to not going to get banned and not picked yet but uh it's gonna be interesting to see if Hunter Thieves picks him up for the first time this split. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It almost it almost feels like he's daring him a little bit. You know, they yeah. taking the NAR blind. Um, that's something you know, people are, are pretty happy playing the GP into the NAR, it feels like. Uh, and if he's not willing to take it, then, you know, it's kind of daring him because this is obviously the most played is the NAR for someday. So yeah. uh, both a good pick for impact and a little bit of a takeaway and closer, I think, at the very least saying, I know what you're doing. <laughs> he's acknowledging <laughs> it. He's reading from the book of Whippo. But will the, yeah, okay. there it is. There it is. Okay. First, okay. Very cool. happy they decided to lock this in because 100 Thieves love scaling. There you go. They're locking the Azir yeah. as well. That's <laughs> a triple scaling carry comp right there already. You've got the Zeri, the Gangplank, and the Azir. All these champions love gathering items, love getting into the late game. And, well, we're going to have to see what he answers the Azir with. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I mean, yesterday, <laughs> JoJo brought up the Akali. It looked pretty good on it. Um, Poppy has been feeling so strong in the current meta to me. You know, She's I, so good. I, how, how, what are you. What are you feeling about Poppy these days? It feels like, you know, maybe even the, the strongest jungler in current meta with so many dash champions available. Oh, there's Nautilus. Um, the thing about Poppy I think that's most interesting is that she seems like uh, she always has value. Her ultimate mm -hmm. and her yeah. W are not relying on cooldown reduction, health, any type of statistics. And generally speaking, in competitive play, that's what you want in your jungle. A jungle right. champion that has value regardless of how much income they have. Because sometimes you have those jungle games where you run around, get two or three free kills in the early game, get a Herald, get get Drakes, get Plates, whatever. And sometimes just it doesn't oh, quite, you, you, yeah. you don't quite get anything. And <laughs> Poppy always having value there. With her ultimate, being able to split up team fights can be broke, is really valuable. You can lock them away. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and with the enemy team still needing to lock in a jungler, EG takes a good opportunity. They ban away Trundle, one of those other champions that always has value no matter what. And also really likes eating the extra defensive stats that Poppy gets from her steadfast presence. So that's taken off the table. Jinx removed by 100 Thieves. They have their AD carry. Their opponents do not. Mismatched picks in the first half of the draft means the bans are going to be the same as now we've got the Braum banned out from EG. And you also know EG is going to have to have some real DPS in their draft. Like, you know, it's relatively low damage composition here already. Uh, MF getting banned out. Would be interesting to see if we get a Kalista. Danny has not been playing a lot of Kalista, has been really much more known like for his Ezreal uh, this split. Uh, it's actually very unique. Uh, Danny does not play Kalista, is the, the general consensus. Yeah. He does not play the champion. So it's going to be interesting to see whether he decides to actually pull it out today. Uh, and he's played some games of it, but I know that. Uh, from what I understand, he hasn't played it once to split, and it's a very hard priority pick. That's the Kaisa. Wow. 
This is this is a throwback. Kaisen Nautilus was like the LPL special a couple of years ago. Like every single game at Worlds, it felt like people were going for these dive compositions. So I'm curious now to see if Jojo Pian is going to pair something a little bit more aggressive alongside it, right? If you if you are playing against Azir and, and Zeri and these champions that have a lot of range, I think it can be more difficult in those later stages. So uh, maybe something a little bit more aggressive along the lines of like an Ari or something like that uh, for EG to try to be playing more heavily towards the dive. What? We've got some more powerful scaling options locked in here. Diego. <laughs> Diego. There's the Viego. It's a closer special. I think it's one of the champions that doesn't mind getting inter his W interrupted. It, it does stop. It does interrupt him. It does ground him. But Diego doesn't mind too much because most of the mobility he has is still in his E. Mm -hmm. And, well, the ultimate, which he can't cast if he's grounded, but tenacity works. So it's yeah. not that bad. You usually have tenacity anyway. I really like the Renata pick here as well. I mean, if you're if you're expecting EG to be playing pretty heavily dive, you know, Nautilus all one of these carries, dive in on them, try to burst this person out, you know, with everyone coming in over the top. And then Renata is a great answer to this, but Ari just makes so much sense to me with the composition that EG have been building. It's what I mentioned earlier. It feels more mid-gamey, and it's something that can set up for the, the Kai'Sa, and also follow up on the Nautilus engage with these dives. I agree with you 100%. The only thing is, is when you're diving into a multi-threat composition, it's scary. you're going to have to really be precise on what you're doing here, because if you don't one-shot one of the carries, the Gangplank and the Zeri, or the Azir, are going to turn <laughs> on you, and they're going to blow the... They're gonna blow EG up, so it's really important they're when you're blow, playing triple threat. PG thirteen warrior. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's it's, it's a real high damage composition out of hundred thieves. Viego loves it when people run into him and gives him resets. He's going yeah. to especially Continue with the bail going. Hundred percent. Honestly, I would say 100 Thieves really wants EG to run into them, and it's going to be all execution for EG to see if they, if they can do it cleanly. So do you think 100 Thieves won the draft then? Or what would you say about the overall status of this one? At the, uh, if, if you had I mean, to give me like a, a forecast here. If I had to, you know, put my put my money on it, I yeah. would say 100 Thieves won the draft. But um, the way I see drafts being played is like, you have to consider player skill, team skill. Yeah. These are things you have to take into account. You know, it's, it's so good at it's, di it's different watching Gala play Kai'Sa and dive in or watching Danny play Kai'Sa and dive in. Right, like they're both world-class players. The question is, is you know those little micro moments, who makes the difference, and that's going to determine like whether the draft works or not. So for me, in this case, like I said, all execution. Hey, it'll come down to the execution, and that's what we love to see. Hundred thieves in EG. Let's do it. For all of y'all that might have missed the draft and are only just now joining us, we got Whippo here for the TriCast to bring us all the action. And speaking of the action, Whippo, where are you expecting this early game to lead us? So I'm expecting 100 Thieves to be popping up to the top side because Gangplank and Nara is generally speaking considered Gangplank is strong enough to bully the Nara around in the early game. He's going to be able to get a, get a slow push, potentially chunk out the Nara. So if he gets low enough, potentially a dive angle for closer here. That said, usually people are aware of this, so it's a pretty stale early game in the bot lane. I think that the, the Zeri pick is considered to be a neutralizing bot lane champion. Mm -hmm. She doesn't really push her advantages, so even if you pair her with the Renata, it's more so for the scaling properties to make sure that Zeri gets the late game rather than to smash the lane bot lane. So both both junglers pathing up the top lane. <laughs> both junglers pathing up to the top lane and making sure that the Nara is safe seems like the safest bet. However, if Impact feels confident that he won't be get low enough, We'll see Inspired go through the bot crab. Oh, it's looking like a potentially a pretty crab. spicy level one, though. Yeah. It's a late invade, but 100 Thieves are stacked. All right. They're not going to They're expecting a late They're invade here. Vision, yeah. yeah. Thinking maybe an attempt onto the chickens there, but... Oh, this was actually a level one gank by... This was a level one gank angle from Vulcan and uh, from Danny mid lane, but uh, oh. they, they got spotted over that ward. There's a blue... I believe that's... A, yeah, that's a blue ward. I you think know that, what I wonder? Their bot lane walked over there. Is that... This This actually... So yesterday, um, we, we saw the poppy raptors to raptors start. Yeah, I yeah. think that was the, mm -hmm. the path that Inspire did. You know, the late invade to actually get the level one ward on the raptors. I wonder if he was expecting Viego might have started on a buff and he could actually go for the same style of, of path you know, go down, try to take those Raptors away. Well, I like the fact that 100 Thieves is aware that this happened just yesterday, that they yeah. did have this early advantage and didn't give them the opportunity to play for that here again. You can see our junglers are both pathing towards that bottom side of the map right now as Abadaga and Jojo getting into it a little bit here. And we even heard from Jojo before this match kind of talking about Abadaga in the laning phase. 
So what's really interesting about the mid lane matchup is Ari, generally speaking, gives push and skills W to try and get some harass down. So that's why you see a lot of trading going on. He manages to get the push. Now, what I'm really interested in is the way the top lane is going right now, because like I mentioned earlier, Gangplank does have the push on Nar, can chunk him low. And if he forces the Mega Nar here with uh, the vehicle coming up to the top side, that might be a potential dive angle. Oh, I do love myself some early game dives if they work. You can see Closer still down here in this bottom part of the jungle, walking into the river now, but not choosing to go for any sort of an invade just yet. Of course, yeah. Evil Geniuses are still going to have the information there. That ward that was placed before the jungle camp spawned only just now expired. And you can see how far towards the top side Jojo was playing. You know, obviously had vision that Closer was coming through the bot side. Wasn't really at any sort of a risk. So Closer not wasting any time. Saw that Jojo was hugging towards top side. Realized he's been spotted and he's just going to continue clearing. Uh, it will give a lot of knowledge, though, over to EG. You, know, you talked about the potential to try to pull off a dive on impact, but uh, he will have full information on where Vigo is. So what's really interesting uh, about Inspired's pathing is he skips the wolves and comes to the top crab to make sure that there's no dive angle. As you can see, Impact's half HP, Mini Nar doesn't have the Mega to keep him safe, and the wave crashes on the Gangplank side. Now, 100 Thieves weren't looking for the dive, but I really like the fact that Inspired made sure that if they were looking for it, he was there for the counter, making sure the Nar is safe. Because as you can see, he's half HP, it's a Mini Nar, he's almost one shot. If Diego mm -hmm. connects the stun, he's just straight up dead. And making sure that that doesn't happen, no accidents in the early game, nothing crazy. Bot lane is safe, mid lane is safe. Uh, Very good. Like, little, little, little bit of love. see here. EG uh, just uh, scaring them away so they can crash that wave in. Yeah, just a little bit of flexing to make sure that there's no freezing shenanigans going on for uh, 100 Thieves bot lane there. And uh, going to take their free reset here. Now, the Gangplank is going to be trying to get his recall here. Missed some CS in the early game, so he didn't quite have a sheen after the fourth wave. That's where you want to aim your recall for. Uh, just going to stay in the lane. Uh, farm up for, you know, potentially something other than the sheen. Now, I would personally base TP here, grab my sheen, and start, you know, blasting the hell out of this Nar, but... He has a different view. Sure, why not? Yeah. And I mean, it, it is a little bit risky though when you get trapped in lane with no mana as GP, because obviously you can start to really kind of give control over uh, pretty simply to that to that NAR and impact. You know, potentially can now push him in, get him much better reset himself. You know, Mega's out. He still has his potion. There's no corrupting potion charges left for someday. He does have a biscuit, but uh, there's not really any threat on impact right now with GP low on mana. So as you said, he's kind of giving over control by not basing Gang Machine, refilling on the potions. And as we're talking about the Gangplank here, Whippo, I want to ask you, as somebody who's played plenty of Gangplank yourself, this is a champion that we do see a couple of different builds and approaches in different games, different matchups, different scenarios. How would you like to see someday build it and play it in this game specifically? So there's two ways of looking at it, is if you feel like you need to be a more frontline-focused champion, someone that won't get one-shot when EG's dive comp flies in, then you can build a more bruisery build. But recently, I feel like he's beefy enough since the durability patch that even when he's building crit, you still quite, can't quite one-shot him. So as long as you respect the depth charge coming out of Nautilus, which is the only CC that he can't cleanse with his oranges, I think he's just going to straight up one-shot whoever is going to jump in if he gets a crit. And that's kind of Gangplank's name right now is, depending on how much crit chance you get, your skill improves. Because <laughs> if you get the crit, you're going to absolutely run a team. You're an amazing player. How absolutely many cloaks carried. can one pirate wear? Well, oh, flash got, forward. We got inspired down here. Looking to make something happen. There comes the lockdown from Vulcan, but 100 Thieves getting themselves away. The clash out of FBI staying alive there. Vulcan spinning his own flash, trying to make the play happen. Now, Closer's showing up. Doesn't look like they'll have the angle to make anything else go down here. So one for one flash trades about all it's going to be. That seems pretty good, though, for EG, getting the flash off of FBI, going to put a lot more pressure on him. Of course, Closer staying around, going to be able to push this in and look for a potential reset here. Um, but there is the opportunity to try to make a repeat down towards bot side, try to take out FBI here later on before that flash comes back up. So something really interesting about this game is that both junglers have been incredibly inefficient. Both junglers have been running around to make sure their laners are safe mm -hmm. rather than farming for themselves efficiently. So you see the poppy has 32 CS. He hasn't really been farming. He's been making sure he's covered top lane, when bot lane covers bot lane, and then even closer himself, which had an advantage from farming, farmed both his bot camps, based run bot again, even though his top camps are spawning. And I think this goes back to exactly what you were talking about in Champ Select, saying, hey, sometimes as a jungler, you have to operate on low econ, right? You have to make these decisions for the sake of the team. And that's when all these powers, like having Poppy's natural stats, having the ability to deny dashes or yeet somebody up in the air, feels even better. Well, and it reminds me so much of, a, of an interview that Santorin gave last week when he was talking about playing against Pride Stalker, where he's talking about how, you know, sometimes the, the like worst path is the best path because it's, it's the one that they won't expect, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you're trying to do something that isn't so predictable because people are so adept at tracking jungle pathing. If you're just doing a full six camp clear, resetting on your camps, people know the respawn timings, people know exactly where you are on the map. So both these junglers, I think, trying to subvert expectations somewhat uh, and be a little bit less predictable. 
I think that's very smart. Like in this particular case, when you have such volatile lanes, because I feel like Kaisa Nautilus, if they start getting an advantage, it's going to get really scary at oh, six. Yeah. Same way the other way around. If Zarya or Nana gets ahead, it's going to be quite rough. So now he's going to run down the gangplank here. Uh, as when he gets Mega, that's his timing to really start skirmishing with the gangplank. That's when he's really going to win those trades. And every time he's mini, his gangplank's opportunity to dictate the lane. So he's trying to flex his Mega Nar here, try and get an advantage. But since both junglers are missing on the map, no, nothing too aggressive after that. <laughs> The situation also feels a little bit better for Impact because he does have the Tier 2 boots versus only the Tier 1 of Sunday. We all know how ranged versus melee can feel in those sorts of situations. And there's just such a dark top side of the map, right? Yeah. There's no wards in this entire section for Impact, so you're not really going to want to chase back past the river. You know, all of EG warding has been down towards this bot side, trying to set up for a potential dragon. You know, they had three pink wards down in that bottom river area, so uh, very clearly playing towards that side. Impact's kind of on weak side duty for now. Um, but GP can be pretty happy playing in that situation as well, you know, for cross-map Baltis. Oh yeah, absolutely, when you're looking for the ultimate. But when it comes to the 1v1, uh, Nar is a champion that really tries to play in sustain. He doesn't have a resource bar other than his rage bar. And what's interesting about Nar's resource bar is that it actually heals him. The max health he gets from turning Mega stays when he goes mini again. You gotta love that infinitely sustaining lane state, unless you're laning against it, of course. Then it might be a little bit frustrating <laughs> in those types of moments. But I like the fact that you bring up the dragons and the vision from EG, Isaac, because we have seen a couple of these in recent games here just this weekend. Very early Drake takes six minutes, seven minute Drake. This time around, it's not happening. The first neutral objective aggroed is actually closer going after the Rift Herald here, but EG not willing to just let it happen. This is looking like a full 5v5 setup onto this Herald here. They, they're calling it the Nar just popped his Mega, doesn't have Mega. That's why EG He's looking to contest. Oh, Inspired had two smite charges, so he actually used his one smite charge to upgrade the smite, so he could contest. Oh. Because he was on the undeveloped smite there, and he saw Closer did have his challenging smite, so now they both have the 950 smite. Hunter Thieves gonna back it up and actually give that away, but that's a clever play, I think, from Inspired. Very much so. I, I messed up there. I called that EG's gonna come contest when uh, Nara is mini. It was the opposite. Hunter Thieves felt like they had a timing because the mini Nara was just popped. Mega <laughs> ran out, he was tired. So they start the Herald, see how it looks, but unfortunately they weren't able to get Pixel top, Pixel dot. They weren't able to get control there, and with Jojo Kun waiting in that bush, they felt like face checking was going to be way too hard. Feels really good to be able to walk away with that neutral objective like that. No fight required. You just come up, puff up your chest a little bit, look tough. They're not able to deal with it at all. And now we'll have to see where Inspire chooses to use that Herald as impact. Going in here on Sunday there with the Mega Nar ulti. Of course, Nar players often like to just throw that one out there, use it for trading, use it for wave clear. Sunday's gonna be taken low, and impact backs away as Jojo tries to find a little bit of trading here with Abadaga. Nothing too, nothing too impressive here. Obviously, the Narl's being used for trading advantage. Like I said, sustain is really important. Mm -hmm. you're, you're literally using that ult as a trading tool for, for more sustain differential. Oh, oh, baby! Oh, Jojo, you might be in some trouble, buddy. Abadaga takes him down to about 100 HP, but Inspired walking through a ward as he comes up to escort Private Jojo oh. home. The Gangplank ulti hits him with the first volley, but Jojo reacts fast enough to dash out of the way of any further damage. The evil genius's mid laner just barely surviving. Man, it actually feels so bad as GP when your first ult gets nothing, though. The cooldown is yeah. so long in the early game. So going for the finishing blow there doesn't actually get it. And it will allow Impact to play a little bit more aggressively in the 1v1, knowing that it's down. Uh, but so far, so good. It feels like 400 Thieves. You know, you talked about the, the heavy scaling that they were drafting for Whippo. You know, right. Zeri, Azir, GP. And they're up 500 gold. There hasn't been a lot of action, which does feel like it favors them. So there's a little bit of a CS lead in the top lane, but this is the thing about Gangplank that makes him so powerful, is CS leads don't translate gold. to gold leads because he <laughs> makes so much free gold. Once he reaches Trinity Force, he also reaches a point where he's one-shotting minion waves from super safe distance. He has the oranges to cleanse any potential threat from dives. The champion is just incredibly safe and scales like an absolute monster, so even though a 10 CS lead is nice, it's not significant enough for uh, impact to really make a difference in the game. Like, mm -hmm. significant advantages uh, is, is different from having an advantage, right? Like, does 10 CS mean anything? And in this case, in the Gangplank NAR matchup, it really doesn't. Great play from Sunday, finding a base as well against the NAR, because now he's actually gonna have the pressure in the lane as well. So this 10 CS lead is slowly gonna get smaller and smaller. It's really great play from, from Sunday in this matchup. Oh, 3v3 bot side. FBI gonna be your target at the start as Danny has to try to get away. Inspired, not gonna get a whole lot done there with that ulti, but not a glass ult fired off now as Shelly makes her way into the turret. No one really low off of that one, but back here in the mid lane, we got Jojo Whoa. in trouble again. Abadaga is absolutely Whoa. slamming. 
winning this 1v1. Again, JoJo getting away with so little health there. The skirmish on the bot side felt like it was mostly just EG fighting to get the Herald in for the crash. They are able to get it and get that gold, but you know, EG did not take any really early dragons or anything, so there's not a lot of pressure on 100 Thieves to actually fight them. 100 Thieves, I think, are pretty happy sitting back and farming, and it's going to be on EG to try to force their hand with these objective takes, with these objective setups, but really, you don't have to care until third dragon, which is still a good eight minutes away. 100%. I think what's most interesting is how well the junglers have been matching each other and how well Abedag has been using that to his advantage as Impact's trapping in the bush. He's trying a little bit of an advantage, but unfortunately, he still hasn't based. You see in the inventory, some days up like what, a thousand, like 1500 gold yeah. up on the NAR? Like, he's, unfortunately, Impact isn't strong enough right now in order to squeeze any leads out further. So, what's going to end up happening here is uh, Gangplank's going to try and get it, try and get a base off for his Trinity Force. And at this point, as you can see, 2300 gold in the bank for Impact. Spending your gold is really important when you want to push a gold lead. And in this case, Impact hasn't yet. So, Someday doesn't really feel any pressure, even though he's a little bit behind. Right, it's kind of another part of what you were talking about earlier with those gold, those CS leads not actually being gold leads. Well, gold leads don't matter until they turn into item leads. Gold in your pocket does not make your character any better at combat. And so Impact stuck up here with a Dorian shield and a pair of shoes, not exactly frightening to the pirate who, as you already touched on, can farm so safely, so effectively. It's just not that big of a deal someday setting down the barrel and blow that one up. Back here in bottom, things are pretty close, pretty even still, but my eyes are on mid lane as Abadaga has found Jojo nearly twice now, has never been able to seal the deal. 13 minutes in, we're still zero to zero. No kills on the board for either side. And Abadaga had been getting criticized a lot for his laning phase, but we heard Jojo in the interview before the game, you know, talking about how, hey, he actually thinks Jojo, uh, Abadaga is a good laner and that he is trying to make these aggressive plays in lane and really fight for Cryo. And we have seen that quite a bit. So what's really interesting about the mid lane matchup in this particular game is even though there's not a, any CS lead whatsoever almost on Azir side, he's almost a full level up. Mm -hmm. If you look at if you look at Azir, he's already level 10. I checked the experience. Jojo hasn't hit level 10 yet, and Abadag is nearing level 11. Yeah. He just ding level 10. Abadag is almost level 11. So he's got a full level up on Jojo Pion. And why this is very important is because a level is about 600 gold worth of. Experience. It's a lot. Like one level is 600 gold. That's a lot of money. And I also think that, hey, that's the reward that you get for chasing him out of this lane yeah. twice, right? Yes, it does feel bad. You talked about, like, the Gangplank Ultimate not being able to get it. Jojo walking away with 50 HP. Yes, it feels bad, but at least you are getting that EXP advantage, that reward in some aspect. And there it is, Abadaga level 11. As soon as he gets it, as soon as he gets the chance, he goes right in. Beautiful play. over the wall. And first blood! to the Emperor of Shariva. Beautifully played. Flashing ahead of time, knowing that he, is, he has the WQ. He doesn't try to WQ over the wall, greet his flash, see if he can get the kill. Hell no, he flashes over the wall, knows that if Jojo Pun tries to flash, it's gonna be too late because he has the range to WQ because that's the thing about Azir is his soldiers are really slow. So when you Q forward with your soldiers, you gotta wanna make sure they go the shortest distance possible to be able to connect the slow and then finish him off. So really well played. Also, catching him on the tip of that uh, Emperor's Divide. Quite impressive. Yeah, barely getting him there with the engage. As you said, Abadaga, you know, committing the flash early. Closer, of course, you know, coming in. They go in, they get him knocked in. They aren't able to land, actually, the Viego stun. It was pretty well played from Jojo. Lands the charm on Closer, trying to get away, but the flash follow was there. Even with three all charges and the flash from Jojo, can't create enough space to actually uh, get out. And, hey, they get that second Drake, so any chance of having these early soul points, early big Drake fights that demand some sort of a response, those are nowhere nearby for either side. And now having said that, I gotta ask you guys, where do you think we're gonna really get that first big team fight then? Because this has been a very slow game in terms of PvP, and there's no Dragon Soul on the horizon anytime soon. I'm, I'm looking at third Drake, like not even okay. fourth, honestly. Like the fact that there's a one, one to one in Drake's is 16 minutes. They're giving up another Herald here, or at least they're, they're investigating, they have a ward here. This is what I call, I like to call it like, you're sniffing around. You know, you're having, you're, you're having a little whiff of the enemy team, you know? <laughs> Anyone making any mistakes, you know? <laughs> you're not 100% committed to fighting to the death if all of their members it's are there. It's pretty good, apparently. No, it, going it's in. looking great. This is what I mean, like, they, they investigate and because they didn't put enough members on the Herald. Oh, never mind. Oh. This is going to be a full on fight. 100 Thieves might have took the Herald, but they can't get to the eye. Evil geniuses come in and they're going to find the first kill on the Closer. 100 Thieves Danny's looking here. to get anything back, but Danny's made his way into the fight and he jumps in with a killer instinct. Jojo grabs a kill on Sunday. Well, there is and it. EGR done. FBI is going to be taken very low. Danny nearly dead. Danny grabbing the kill, but Danny dying now. Abadaga jumps back oh. in. Abadaga takes oh. the one out. Who he's going to keep him alive. And Fight 
in the hundred thieves come out on top just barely not able to take Abadaga down there the bailout coming through and hundred thieves are way ahead off of this one they got the early herald they are able to secure that but eg was posturing for the fight 100 percent. as you can see hundred thieves commits to the herald because they were looking at the objective they felt like oh if they're not committing members we can take this fight however eg was like wait a minute they're contesting Jump in with as many members as possible, and it looks really good at the start. In fact, you would even argue in the middle of the fight it looked really good, up until the very end where Abadage pulls off a hero play with a bailout. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Danny wasn't there at the very beginning, or I think this could have been a very different fight, but everyone from EG was committing in three members, you know, going in over the Azir wall, trying to finish them off, but Abadaga playing this out so well, the bailout coming back up split second before he gets hooked there. They get the kill onto Inspired, so he gets the reset, and Vulcan with no mana, no shot to actually finish off the Azir there. A quad tries, close is like, good job, good <laughs> hell yeah. job. He, he died like 40 seconds yeah. before the last death, the, oh, yeah. before Vulcan died there, so he's like, hell yeah, he's spectating, he's, he's having yeah, fun, he's seats. loving it. That's front the most common the whole, the pro player fight. role swap, yeah. is from, from pro player jungler to a cheerleader after you die you know in the middle of the game <laughs> hey somebody's got to be in the front lines hey, right somebody's got to be the first one dead but beautifully done there from hundreds he's an incredibly close fight i'm happy to cast or curse that one and immediately ask when's the mm -hmm. fight gonna be and now we have a fight this game just exploded and it's hundred thieves sitting on a 2000 gold lead because of it. honestly i think that something that hundred thieves does really well is like they try to investigate looking for a stun here nothing really Nothing really going to happen here. He just wants to make sure that the FBI doesn't feel too unsafe pushing this wave in. He's going to crash this wave. Uh, they're going to try and see what they can do with the Herald that they picked up. I actually don't know if anyone picked it up because it was a... I think it know, expired. I think it yeah, might have too long. got chased off of it. That was a whole fist fight to the death. So no one actually managed to pick it up. But Hunter Thief did get the kill credit for that. So what's really interesting about this game is Hunter Thief's draft has way too much damage. We're trading sides right now. Vulcan's looking for a dive bot lane as they're All going. Right. Let's see. I don't know if they have damage to kill this guy. Yeah, I don't think they do, by the way. Someday just seems completely unimpressed, unafraid, unaffected, or is he? It'll be a one for one, but a two for one now as Abadaga is going to clean up the side of fries that came with that main dish. Oh, he's taking the one for Now I got closer oh, looking this. for Danny. Danny's going to have a tough time with it. Closer going right uh, back in there with the a heartbreaker gets the stun. Danny did his best, but Viego versus Kais is a tough one. Red's my nurse. Can't come in. Dude, can't come in any sooner. It's right ignite, there. It's exhaust. It's, it's all the above. It's, it's all of the above. It's a heal, ignite, ignite, exhaust, <laughs> everything you want. Pop yield used to save the mid tower for a little bit. Is he going to li live? Ooh, Scary. Inspired. Okay. All right. Managed to walk away. Knows. I think Terry will actually ult it there. Yeah. Looks they're like gonna it. lose the tower probably anyway. I mean, I guess we'll see how. Okay, they're gonna TP back in to try to hold this mid lane tier one, but things are getting rough for EG. And they try to pull off that dive bot side, that gets thwarted. Top lane, they are gonna take that tier one, but Abadaga is pushing in the bot lane, and no one's here to answer this. They're also setting up for the dragon, so it looks like everything is kind of going in Hunter Thieves' favor. 100%. Hunter Thieves playing really well, keeping track of where Inspired is almost, because honestly. EG, without Inspired in the bot lane, going for the dive onto Someday looked like a total blunder. Yeah. Like, they didn't even have enough damage to kill him by as two people, and they still went for the play. So definitely a big blunder there, looking for that play, giving Abadagi another two kills, and then a fantastic follow-up by Closer, looking for Danny, because you know the Kai'Sa is going to try and get, a, get her ult off to get in there. How are you feeling about the Ravenous second here from Someday? It seems like it's... It's, it's, it's terrible. You know, you're not a fan. It's straight up. If you want cooldown reduction in your build and you want damage, you want both, please just go quick blades. <laughs> it, it gives you still the crit chance. Gangplank's crit, crit scaling is absolutely disgusting. It's like the best scaling, crit chance scaling champion in the game, and you just don't have any excuses not to build it yeah. unless you're going for a straight up beef bruiser build, something like a hole breaker into Sterax. You're just stacking health, Big stacking resistance. Yeah. yeah, if you're going for the type of bruiser build in that sense, then I can see it. But the Ravenous Hydra, Cyrilda's build that I've been seeing, it just doesn't make sense to me. Gangplank scales well with cooldown reduction, sure, but you've got Quick Blades as an option to give you 30 ability haste straight up. And that's mm -hmm. like about as much as Cyrilda's plus Ravenous Hydra is going to give you with 40. So I don't, I, I'm personally not a fan. I also don't think that the Tiamat or the Hydra has such great interactions with Gangplank that, you know, you're going to get that, the multi-AOE that you're dreaming of. Right. If you get a crit, it, it, it just outperforms any of this. And even if you don't get a crit, the items are still worth building because at some point you're going to reach 60, 80% crit chance and then items like Infinity Edge are yeah. just straight up disgusting. Being able to have IE yeah. in your build is just so ridiculously strong for GP. I mean, one crit barrel in the late game is, is game deciding, right? It like, can be. It always can be. And that's the yeah. thing. Like, you're forcing the enemy team to play around that. Now, the thing about Gangplank, and this is why he's still a first pick, even though people aren't building him crit, is he has so much crowd control in the amount of slows and the effectiveness of his slows. His Death Daughter, the ult upgrade, 
straight up, 90% slow, I believe. It's like 80-90% slow. His ultimate, I think it's a 30% slow, constantly in an area, and his barrels, they scale up to 90% slow, all making it so that if you get hit by a barrel, even if it doesn't crit, it hurts, but it just, your champion can't move. It's yeah. like getting withered by Nasus on an AOE scale. <laughs> it's so like, difficult it to play. It demands a flash out or some sort of save from your teammate or something. The zone control is just so powerful as well, right? Like even if you're not getting hit by the barrels, having to play around them. Oh yeah, like, 100%. If a team with GP has control around Dragon and you're trying to enter through barrels, things like that are incredibly difficult. 100 Thieves pushing in mid, trying to get vision control here around Baron, trying to move into the enemy jungle a little bit. And with a Zer Zeri GP, like they can kill this Baron so fast if they get an opportunity. Three minutes on the dragon is going to mean that the Baron's going to be like, it's going to be, like I said, a sniff, you know? Like, 100 Thieves is going to drop their control there. They're going to see, you know, like, maybe we can start it, maybe we can. We'll see how it feels. But right now, they're really looking for those third item completions, because that's really when Azir is going to come online. You see the large rod straight up prepping them for the death cap. Mm -hmm. Infinity Edge onto the Zeri. That's where, where they're going to feel like they're going to decide the game. And it's However, so scary, man. <laughs> oh, it's so scary when they get there. The most interesting, and I think the biggest X factor, is going to be the Meganar. Yeah. Impact finding a huge flying, getting multiple people into a wall, potentially setting up Danny for a, you know, one of those patented pentakills, hopefully, um, is going to be what we're going to be looking at in order for EG to come back in this game, because it's going to be really hard for them to fight straight up 5v5 with so much damage on so many different, from so many different angles, really. Absolutely. I mean, I'd also add in Inspired, right? Poppy does have that ability to, to be pretty game-changing, right? If you can eject the Azir or the Zeri or the GP from the fight, you know, and have an odd number fight, uh, that can be really, really big. But EG's comp, it feels like it's so heavily execution-based, right? They've got to play these fights perfectly or they're going to get slaughtered because they're outranged so heavily. You know, Kai'Sa cannot play front to back against this type of a team comp. Azir will murder you before you can even get in range to auto attack. So, you know, they have to have perfect engage, get that set up to be able to find those initial kills. But that's really difficult through Bailout and the, the Renata ultimate and GP ult for the slows, like all these things that are going to create space for the 100 Thieves carries. I think that's the hardest part about this game. There's no cleanse on Danny, so he's going to have to navigate through Azir soldiers, through the Gangplank ultimate, yeah. through the Renata ultimate, as well as the fact that even if he manages to do that, that might not be enough. Killing one carry is not enough. They have so much damage. Even if you jump on Abadaki and finish him off, the Gangplank and Zeri, they're still really strong in this game. They're going to be able to turn a fight around. So looking at DG's comp, they've got two X Factors. It's the Marl, and I forgot about this one, but Poppy holds a hell of an X Factor. Yeah. You can do some crazy stuff with this one. So looking at how Inspire is going to split up 100 Thieves can decide the entire game when they go in together, because that's really what they're waiting for. They're waiting for an opportunity. They're waiting for a deep ward, a potential a flank angle that 100 Thieves aren't thinking of. And that's why 100 Thieves is really good at this. They're just giving up everything. They're giving up the space. They don't care. They're scaling. They know what three items. They have absolute confidence that a 5v5 is going to be in their favor. So put yourself in, in EG's shoes, right? You're playing the NAR. You're impacting this game. You know, mm -hmm. what are the key things that you're talking about then to try to find that setup, knowing that it is so difficult? What are the angles you're looking for or, or kind of the, the kind of triggers to start a fight? I think the first thing you need to talk about is item spikes, is when are we strong enough to fight? As the hook comes down onto oh, Closer. Oh boy, Closer trying to get himself away from this one as Inspired goes in, removes the Zeri from the fight. However, the fight has already ended. Closer is able to escape. I like the attempt from EG there, but they didn't have the damage to finish off the jump. And Danny has no flash now. You know, flashed very preemptively. I'm not sure if he was worried about Abadaga or someone actually coming in on him there, but uh, no flash on Danny is going to make his job to navigate this so difficult. Meganar is expiring, and 100 Thieves are going to want this fight. Someday, the one who's able to lead the charge there, he can face check into these charms pretty easily because of the fact that he can eat the oranges and get rid of the CC. 100 Thieves now moving up. Closer's back to full HP thanks to the health that he got from just taking the chicken camp. No big deal. It's 100 Thieves with control over the Drake pit. They're the ones that only have a single Drake to their name, so Evil Genius is yeah. saying, all right, this isn't that good of a fight. We have no flash on our AD no carry. Mega, just surrender no it. Yeah. Exactly. Just give him the second dragon. Oh, this is really painful because this is one of those moments where they were definitely calling, like, we want to fight to the death on this dragon. Like, we, we're, we're, this is where we draw our last breath. Like, that's the type of communication you're going to be trying to pull where you're trying to focus on where do we draw our last breath. As Ronaldo comes down for the mid tower, it's a zoning ultimate very much so. Jojo oh. might get caught. Yeah, Jojo at about half HP. Closer got to be a little careful himself now as he Heartbreaker's back. TP comes in. The impact coming around from the no flank, mega, but he's got no bar. What is he going to do from this angle? He's taken incredibly low. Closer coming in there for the stun. Gangplank Looking barrel at is plays down. Someday's not going to find that connection as Impact makes it away to the top side of the river. He's going to be all right there, but... Mininar flank is not often the best angle in League of Legends. No, it turns out Mininar doesn't really do too much. He's also got a very tanky build. Fortunately for him, this is why you build tanky, is in case you get caught out in a weird situation like that where you're one versus X. 
uh, in this case, three. Uh, you have a tanky build, so it doesn't actually end up dying for this TP, but you can see they're desperate. Yeah, I mean, he spends the TP and the flash, right? And again, these are the playmaking tools that they're so reliant on. When you don't have flash now on Danny, you don't have flash on impact, that is severely limiting your options and your windows, I think, in a lot of these team fights. You know, it's like even if Meganar finds that flank now, well, guess what? There's flash on all the carries on 100 Thieves, so they have the ability to actually respond to that. There's cleanse on Zeri, there's the oranges on Good Someday plus flash, so it's gonna be tough. He's got a stopwatch too, and as you can see, he's gonna go for the shoulders. Not a big fan. However, this is a very important breakpoint in the game. Death Cap is finished, and when Azir finishes Death Cap, the purple worm in that pit dies really fast. Yeah. It dies really fast. So you need to be very careful because as soon as Abadaga disappears into the top side and you have no vision on Baron, you're worried. EG is constantly going to be worried that 100 Thieves is starting the Baron, and we're going to see whether they actually decide to do it or not, because they've played this game very slowly, potentially waiting for even more items, but I think at this point they can actively try to pressure the game and really put a clock on EG's uh, potential game-turning play. And as the Rabadons comes online for the Azir, Lord Dominic's regards being completed as that third item for the Zeri here. I know you guys were talking about how Infinity Edge is so scary, but FBI recognizing, hey, with the Nautilus, with the Poppy, with the Gnar, with all these frontliners, I'm going to have to fight through these things as well. So just getting that extra armor penetration bonus health damage. The carries are now officially online. We always talk about three item spikes. Gentlemen, we are there. We are absolutely there, except for the Void Staff. So this is the interesting about League, thing about League of Legends is where tank items don't scale because of Void Staff, because of Lord Dominix, because of Cerildas. That's the thing about the NAR build that Impact's having is it doesn't scale very well because once those penetration items come in, which already two of them are almost completed, a third one's gonna come in with the Void Staff for Abadage, he's really not going to be tanky at all. So he spent all of his gold that he gathered farming in the side lane, trying to be a tank, but ultimately just getting one shot by Azir and Zeri. Well, they're looking for this play. Yeah. No TP on JoJo, so he's very disconnected. Impact's really going in here, looking for the enemy support. Who he's going to be him. taking low, but the bailout might be able to save him. They can't get the kill in time. Vulcan takes kill number one here for this fight, but 100 Thieves are still looking to find something in return. Run. Nice interrupt there on the steadfast presence. Abadaga jumping in, seeing if maybe he can grab one of these guys. Vulcan's the sacrificial lamb. Abadaga is godlike. Support for support, one for one trade, but 100 Thieves aren't done. Closer with a stolen Nautilus body, still looking to go a little further, but EG have ended They're gonna, this They can scourge. go to Baron. I mean, you know, he's actually gonna have to cancel his recall to avoid that Void Seeker, but they can potentially move back towards Baron. They have enough health. EG has some really low health bars there. Inspire went back to base to heal up. FBI gets charmed. Oh, oh FBI getting out of the CC, and it's gonna be Impact who pays the price. Danny's in the back line, and Danny grabs the enemy AD, but he dies too. Jojo Pyun, he gets caught out. Closers grabbing the kill on that one. 100 Thieves, three for one there, feels good. That's what I was talking about. Even if you manage to snipe FBI out there, great play by Danny to follow up. He holds his Kai's ultimate until the very end, jumps in with the killer, killer instinct at the very end, snipes FBI, but it's just not enough. Someday has too much damage. Abadagi has too much damage. Like, there's still too many threats on this composition, and that's gonna secure 100 Thieves, the Baron play. This is the desperation I was talking about, where Impact sees a great play, manages to snipe out who he, one versus, I, I, he didn't, I, I didn't know how many, he didn't know how many, he probably didn't have any vision, <laughs> he just felt it. And a fantastic play on him to not panic here. He actually commits to the fight. He calls, I'm gonna take the fight here, even though Jojo is very far away, manages to get the pick, but then, unfortunately, uh, Evil Genius just feels too pressured in the game. There's too much scaling on, on 100 Thieves' side that they feel like this is the best, best odds we're gonna get. It's a 4v5, we have no TPs, like there's no, nothing really going on. That's why Vulcan hooks back in, just to try and see if he can get anything done, but unfortunately, 100 Thieves is too strong. And these fights are just so difficult because against Zeri, you know there's not really a way you're gonna get fully out, right? Zeri's starting to stack with the ulti, chasing you down, can E over the walls, so they try to go back in and turn on these plays. If Impact had Mega here, maybe, but the bar is not charged up enough. He tries to go in and follow it up. Danny flies in, does at least get the one kill, but EG lose so much. They lose the Baron as well. Azir already at the death cap, now has you know pieces of the Void Staff. Like He's, he's a full item ahead of Jojo. He's oh, just yeah. so far ahead. Two levels up, full item up. He's, he's having a game of his life, honestly. Like This is straight up what you want your Azir to be, right? Mm -hmm. You want to yeah. be a monster DPS burst machine. Like At this point, he's a burst champion. It's, it's been a pretty incredible mid-gap, this game. Oh, and Abadaga now trying to get back to safety. Maybe I spoke a little bit too soon. Bailout coming out. Ooh. Abadaga can't stay alive through that one, but they barely keep Danny on the board. Who he's going to be taking low, but it's already two members of 100 Thieves of EG, excuse me, that have bit the dust. 
The remaining three try to get out, but who he closer and someday continue the chase. Closer's got the stolen Gnar body still, not gonna find the boomerang there. Bottom lane, the minion wave's already in position. 100 thieves are gonna get two inhibitors off of that one. We're gonna see if they're gonna look for an end here. It's a potential angle in my opinion, but uh, they might just play it safe because they feel good. No, no, there it is. They're gonna look for the TP with the 0 and 25. So the thing is, this is gonna be a straight up 4v3 until everyone respawns, Towers and then it's a 5v5. Yep, first next One turret. Turret power. It's already gone, my friends. Who he, the only one low. The other 300 Thieves players all at max HP here for this one. Inspired Danny and Vulcan have got to try to keep these guys away however they can, but it is so damn difficult. Vulcan now having to back up. Inspired having to back up. He goes back in. The Nexus is under fire, but Vulcan's dead first. Inspired and Danny try to fight, but fight they won't. And it's 100 Thieves putting the second law on EG's record. A huge win for 100 Thieves. Very well controlled game here. Abadaga was massive for them. After that Quadra killed a huge fight around the blue buff, it felt like oh, it was yeah. all about the Azir. And as you said, Popo, even if they can knock out one of these carries, you know, they got that kill mid lane on the Azir, but so much has to be committed to do it. Once Danny's pushed out of the fight, they have no damage left in the composition, so the Zeri and the Gangplank just run them over. Fantastic use of the bailout here. Both times, Abadaga got so much more extra damage in the game-deciding fights thanks to this bailout, and as as you just agreed with me, there's too much damage on their composition. So <laughs> if anyone gets too fed on that comp and you have to focus him, the other two are still there. And it wasn't like Sunday and FBI were weak either. They were farming out equally and uh well, that's all she wrote for EG for this one. And when I asked you in Champ Select, you said, well, if I have to put money on the table, I'm saying 100 Thieves won the draft, and I've got to agree <laughs> after seeing that, man. Like, the Renata combo with these carries, even if Bailout doesn't save you, right? Like, we got to see it get the save on the Azir. It didn't get the save that second time there at the very end, but still just the damage opportunity that it affords, clutch. On EG's side, however, I love the X-Factors. I'm personally, I, some people might consider me to be an X-Factor player. I love taking champions that people consider to be, oh, they don't scale well, they don't do anything crazy. But making people change their minds of like, wait a minute, when this guy plays it, that does a whole different thing than I would champions. expect. And uh, I, I really love the Poppy Kaisa. Like, I like the dive comp, I like the idea. Uh, into the Zeri, however, one of the safest champions. Mm -hmm. uh, not so convinced, you know, they see the Zeri first pick and they think we're gonna just murder her with the dive comp. Not personally what I think is the counter to Zeri. She loves it when people run into her. So uh, maybe back to the drawing board there or just something they wanted to test, I'm not sure. And it, it feels like, you know, 100 Thieves were able to call EG's bluff a little bit, right? They went blind Nar. the yep. fact that you said, hey, somebody has not played GP at all this split. Maybe they were not expecting that to come out, but 100 Thieves had the answers and I think played it out very, very well. Well, Hi is going to go pro to pro with FBI when we return. But after a battle between Thieves and the reigning LCS Kings, it's the Thieves that end up taking back the throne on that one. And with that, it is our pleasure to present to you a sneak peek of HBO's House of the Dragon, premiering August 21st. Take a look. War is a foot. The dream it was clearer than a memory. And I heard the sound of thundering arms, splintering shields and ringing swords. And I placed my heir upon the Iron Throne. And all the dragons roared as one. I consider the matter urgent. That of your succession. Well, who else would have a claim? The firstborn child. Rhaenyra. No queen has ever sat the Iron Throne. The king has an heir, Daemon Targaryen. I will not be made to choose between my brother and my daughter. Rhaenyra's succession will be challenged. Knives will come out. You are the king. Your duty is to take a new wife. I have decided to name a new heir. I'm your heir. War is afoot. Do you think the realm will ever accept me as their queen? A woman would not inherit the Iron Throne. Because that is the order of things. When I'm queen, I will create a new order. Your family has dragons. They are a power men should never have trifled with. If 
Rhaenyra comes into power, she could cut off any challenge to her succession. I am to inherit the Iron Throne. She will block my way. Our hearts remain as one. Oh, our hearts were never one. Have you never imagined yourself on the Iron Throne?